Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adon Alum Messianic Congregation. We are glad to uh, have you with us this evening. My name is Todd Lesser. Uh, I'll be leading the service this evening, and I will be assisted by uh, Fred Scott and uh, Randall Anderson will be our cantor for the evening. And um, <clears throat> we uh, like to let people know that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are here to proclaim the Jewishness of the Messiah, the Jewishness of our new covenant faith. One of the ways that we do this is by using Hebrew uh, in some of the songs and in some of the prayers, but we will translate the Hebrew because we also see ourselves as a community, uh, as the one new man that the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the uh, Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. And so you're having the opportunity to experience that tonight. You may hear some of the prayers that uh, we will chant that you haven't heard before. These chants go back hundreds, in some cases even thousands of years, perhaps all the way to the time of Yeshua and before. So uh, as you are, are hearing these chants, you may want to even picture Yeshua actually saying the chants or uh, being uh, able to hear them as well. Uh, and we uh, see the Sabbath uh, as a time when we seek to truly understand what it means to enter into the Lord's rest. Uh, we see it as a weekly divine appointment that the creator of the universe has established to uh, meet with his people according to Leviticus 23 verse 2. And we trust that this service will be a blessing to you this evening. As we begin our service, I'm going to call up Rebecca Haberman uh, to usher in the Sabbath with the traditional lighting of the Sabbath candles. <coughs> Excuse me, and ask you to direct your attention to the front at this time. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by your word and has given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Ara, for assisting. Well, we uh, are now in a period of time traditionally referred to as Seferat HaOmer in the Hebrew. It means the counting of the Omer. Uh, it's actually the counting of the days in the seven week period between Yom HaBikurim, the Feast of First Fruits, and Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Uh, once again, these uh, appointed times of the Lord are described uh, in Leviticus 23. We find uh, in Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, it says, And you shall count unto you from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the Omer, the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the day after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new mincha, or grain offering, unto the Lord. The seven-week count begins on the day following the weekly Sabbath of Passover, and the last day of the seven-week count will be the 50th day, which is why the feast is called Pentecost by some from the Greek connected to the number 50. We will have a blessing, and then we will announce the next day in the count. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher hatzdekenu al yedei emunah, v'yeshua hamashiach v'tzibanu al sefirat haomer, which means, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has justified us by faith in Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us regarding the counting of the Omer. 
היום שבעה ימים שהם שבוע אחד לאומר, which means today is seven days, which are one week of the Omer. We are beginning the seventh day of the seven week count from the waving of the sheaf. At this time, I'm going to call up our cantor, Randall Anderson, and ask you to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. Uh, this prayer is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, uh, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, uh, known as the Via Hafta. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join me as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu velohavo tenu elohavraham elohei yitzkak velohei yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to uh, gather together, Lord, once again for this weekly divine appointment uh, as we've concluded our observance of uh, Pesach, Passover, Chag Matzah, Unleavened Bread, and Bikurim, First Fruits, Lord. And we just uh, pray that uh, even as we count down towards Shavuot, Lord, that you would reveal truths to us, that we might uh, better understand your love for us. We might better understand uh, your faithfulness to every covenant promise that you have made. And Lord, we just uh, desire to better understand what it means tonight to enter into your rest. Uh, as we remember, Lord, uh, that you are the creator. You created the world in six days and you rested on the seventh. You are the God who heard the cries of your people when they were enslaved in Egypt. And you provided the deliverer in terms of Moses, Lord. But also you heard the cry of each one of us who needed uh, redemption from our bondage to sin. And you sent your son to be the sacrifice that not only brings forgiveness for our sins, but brings uh, a renewed relationship, a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. And Lord, we pray for uh, Jonathan Sattel for uh, what is going on uh, with him health-wise, Lord. And we just pray that, uh, Lord, a, a miracle seems to be what it's going to take. But we know, Lord, that you are able to perform the miracle today that is needed uh, for him and for each one of us. And Lord, we thank you that you are the miracle working God as we ask you to, to bless, to anoint this service, to anoint the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, all that we do this evening, Lord, we dedicate it to you. We ask you to speak to the hearts of our Jewish people gathered in synagogues around the world, Lord, uh, that they would uh, just understand from the, the revelation of the portions uh, your love for them and your desire for them to turn back to you, uh, Lord, to uh, understand that you have provided your son uh, as the sacrifice for your covenant people and for all mankind. 
Lord, we dedicate this service to you. We look forward to all that you're going to do this evening. And Lord, we just uh, desire that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. We ask these things in our Messiah, Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, now I'm going to call up Shona Ryder to make a few announcements for us this week. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. If you're a first-time visitor this evening, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you have not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so we can get you one. The packet contains brochures which will tell you about our congregation and our services. You will also find a visitor's card, which will ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we are blessed to have you with us this evening. This Tuesday, April 18th at 7.30 p.m., we will be having our Yom Hash HaShoah Holocaust Memorial Day service. We acknowledge the heroes, mourn the victims, and remember these events in the hope that they will never again be repeated. All are welcome. There will be no Oneg afterwards. One week from this Sunday on April 23rd at 4 p.m., we will have our annual membership meeting. This meeting is for members and prospective members only. We'll be providing important dates on what's going on in your congregation. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us this evening. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So once again, despite what the, the PowerPoint screen may have said, it's uh, this coming Tuesday, April 18th, when we will be having our Holocaust Memorial Day service. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> the 23rd is the membership meeting. Now we will chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. We will be chanting uh, the Hebrew of Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. And then we will recite the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, Yisrael, Keep the Shabbat 
to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I will call forward our ARC opener, Eli Scott, uh, as well as Fred Scott, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask that you would please stand as the ARC is opened. The ARC is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll, known as the Torah, frequently translated as law, but a better uh, description is that uh, it really means instruction. And uh, it is the scroll with the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. It reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. And it came to pass, whenever the Ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mount, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Simcha, Dov, Ben Ruvin, and Barbara, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Barkuit Adonai Hamvarach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim V'natan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Adonai Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 24th day, the first month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Nisan. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 through 47. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Vayikra. We'll be reading from chapter 11, verses 44 through 47, found on page 121 in the Complete Jewish Bible. For I am Adonai your God, therefore consecrate yourselves and be holy. For I am holy, and do not defile yourselves with any kind of swarming creature that moves along the ground. Maftir. For I am Adonai, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Therefore you are to be holy, because I am holy. Such then is the law concerning animals, flying creatures, all living creatures that move about in the water, and all creatures that swarm on the ground. It is per its purpose is to distinguish between the unclean and the clean, 
and between the creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanim Torah demet Vakaye olam nata pitokinu Baruch atah Adonai Notein ha Torah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Fazod ha Torah, Asher Samoshe, Lifnei B'nei Yisrael al pi Adonai B'yad Moshe Etzkayim hi L'amakazikim ba V'tom keha Me'ushar D'rakeha Darke which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it, and blessed are the ones who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which are spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of the truth and righteousness. Amen. 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 Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Shmuel Beit. We'll be reading from chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, found on page 340 in the Complete Jewish Bible. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Avedav on the hill with Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Avedav, driving the new cart. They led it from the house of Avedav on the hill with the ark of God. Aho uh, walked in front of the ark. David and the whole house of Israel celebrated in the presence of Adonai with all kinds of musical instruments made of cypress wood, including lyres, lutes, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. When they arrived at Nahon's threshing floor, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark of God. But Adonai's anger blazed upon uh, against Uzzah and God struck him down in the spot for his offense so that he died there by the ark of God. Amen. Amen. The blessing following with the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are truth and righteous. 
Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no words of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful and fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Asher natan manu Mashiach Yeshua, Bahadirot shel habrit ha'kadashah, Baruch atah Adonai, Notain habrit ha'kadashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from Acts chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Again, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, found on page 1374 in the Complete Jewish Bible. As Keva entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell prostrate at his feet. But Keva pulled him to his feet and said, Stand up, I myself, I am just a man. As he talked with him, Keva went inside and found many people gathered. He said to them, We are well aware of that for a man who is a Jew to have, for a Jew to have close association association with someone who belongs to another people or to come and visit him is something that just is not done. But God has shown me not to call any person common or unclean. Amen. 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 <clears throat> And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu hadabar haimet, Vekai olam nata betokinu, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein habrit hakadashah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the sake of your da servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word and the Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. 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 When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. We are going to uh, recite the Kaddish, a uh, traditional Jewish prayer that is often thought of as a prayer of mourning because it's recited at funerals, but it's actually a prayer in Aramaic of praise and exaltation to our Creator. Tonight we'll recite the Kaddish for the Yart site. Uh, the memory of Shona Ryder's parents, who both passed away right around this time. Her father, Ari Ben Shaul, 
who passed on the 10th of Nisan a number of years ago, and her mother, Cyril Bat Hadassah, who passed on the 25th of Nisan a number of years ago. So uh, we will all stand and say this prayer together in support. If you know the Aramaic, you can say it uh, along with us. We have the transliteration up there. Uh, if not, we will be reciting the English translation afterwards. Yit Gadal Yit Gadash Shemei Rabbah Bialma Divra Hirute Vyamlich Malchute Bechai Yechon Uvyomechon Uvkaye de Kal Beit Yisrael Baagala Uvizman Kariv Vimru Amen Yehesh Me Raba Mevarach Leolam Ulame Almaya Yit Barach, the Yish Tabach, the Yit Paar, the Yit Romam, the Yit Nase, the Yit Hadar, the Yit Ale, the Yit Halal, Shemei de Kudusha, Bariahu, Leila Min Kal Birchata, the Shirata, Tush Bachata, the Nechem Ata, Damiran Bialma, the Mru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shamaya, Vachayim Aleinu Veal Kal Yisrael, Vimru Amen. O say Shalom Bim Romav, Hu Yaase Shalom Aleinu, Veal Kal Yisrael, Vimru Amen. And now let us recite together the English translation. Glorified and sanctified be his great name in the world, which is created according to his will. May he cause the reign of his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the life of all the house of Israel speedily, yes, soon, and say amen. May his great name be blessed forever and ever eternally blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded, be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be He, who is high above, far above, all blessings and hymns and praises and consolations which are spoken in the world, and say, Amen. May there be great peace from heaven and life for us, and for all Israel, and say, Amen. He who makes peace in the heavenly realms, may he make peace for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. That is a uh, traditional prayer that uh, is recited by Jewish people as part of the uh, Sabbath liturgy. Uh, it's even chanted in the uh, liturgy, but when it's recited as a memorial prayer, uh, then we just uh, say it. We don't chant it. And um, anyone who has lost someone uh, in the recent past or around this time of year, uh, we just trust that it will be a blessing, that the God of peace will comfort all who mourn and will grant peace uh, to all those uh, who are uh, in need of his comfort. Well, this has been quite a week. Uh, Passover concluded on Wednesday. Uh, our observance included our community Passover Seder this past Friday. I certainly hope that was a blessing uh, to all who were there. And we call it Passover, but actually the week includes the appointed times of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. As I mentioned earlier, they're uh, listed in Leviticus chapter 23. First fruits, or uh, Reshit Hakatsir, the first of the harvest, as it's described uh, in that chapter, uh, was fulfilled in the re resurrection of our Messiah, who is described in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 as the first fruits resurrection of all who have died, providing the hope that we also one day will experience this victory over the most fearful weapon of this world, death. Uh, for, for those of you who have spent the week eating matzah, I hope that the unleavened bread, I hope every bite reminded you of the God who heard the cries of his people and sent a deliverer to lead them out of their bondage. 
And we can clearly see in hindsight, as I've already mentioned this evening, that this was merely a coming attraction for when the Lord would send his son as the deliverer that leads all of us out of our bondage to sin. The other significant event that took place this past week was our purchase of a building in Greenville yesterday. About a month ago, on Por yes, it, there, we're going to have lots of opportunities to celebrate that because uh, the, re the main thing that I want to tell you about this is to give God the glory for the miracles that it has taken. And, and we can really see that uh, in some of the things I'm going to describe. The first miracle was in being able to obtain a loan. And that really came from anyone over uh, the last 20 to 25 years who have been a part of this congregation and have ministered or even uh, supported us financially, they all had a part in that uh, that enabled us to get a loan that uh, I was really not sure about. At the rabbi's conference, I was asking uh, my friends who are rabbis uh, to just pray for a supernatural miracle. But then once we saw that miracle and we got approved for that loan, it was like, oh, okay, things should go smoothly from here on out. Uh, but it didn't quite work out that way. And for about the last month, I've been telling you at the end of the service, keep praying. There's one major hurdle uh, yet to overcome. And um, miraculously, we were able to overcome that as well. And this is uh, how that took place. About a month ago, on Purim, uh, just before we had our Purim celebration here at the congregation, I went to a drop-in where they were talking about the downtown airport area. And the one person I talked to in detail, uh, I found out later was the assistant city manager, uh, and she had told me that they viewed our case favorably and that they'd met with the State Aeronautics Commission, whose recommendation we were trying to get uh, earlier that day. So I had no idea who this person was, and she ended up being the assistant city manager. Then exactly one month later on Passover, we received our approval. But it was based on our planning a relatively small renovation uh, because we have renters in the building. Uh, we let the city know that we needed approval for a much larger renovation uh, that we might choose to do in a couple years after the renter's lease runs out. The next day, that now we're on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We got the approval from the city stating that their approval was good for a, a more extensive renovation in the future as well. And so <clears throat> we are uh, hopeful that, well, actually this, oh, and that all took place two days, we, we closed yesterday and uh, tomorrow was actually the day when our um, rate guarantee was going to run out. And rates, in fact, have gone up another quarter of a point. And that could have been the amount that would have uh, caused us to look not nearly as, uh, the bank to not look nearly as favorably upon us. But once you see that miracle, you've got to wonder, are, are they still coming? Uh, because now we are beginning two processes. Uh, one is fundraising, as we uh, have stepped out on faith, taking a significant loan to make the purchase. Uh, the loan was about four times the loan that we uh, took out when we purchased this building. Um, yet we were able to pay this building off uh, within seven years, and we are hopeful of doing that as well. Uh, and we have pledge cards on the back table for those uh, who want to make a, a either a one-time or a regular commitment uh, to uh, supporting our effort to uh, renovate the building, and, and we hope to be in there. Uh, we hope to pay off the loan once again in less than seven years, and we hope to complete the renovation and be in the building <coughs> before the uh, end of this year. Secondly, we're starting a renovation process to create a sanctuary and fellowship area in what is currently an office building. And first, we have to prepare and submit the permit to do this. And then once the permit is issued, we'll have the opportunity to participate in the demolition of some of the interior walls. So you can begin warming up those sledgehammer muscles um, as uh, we hope. Uh, like I said, to be able to uh, start that within the next couple months uh, and then to be in the building before the end of the year. 
So let's just go to the Lord uh, in prayer, asking him to bless this time and giving him the praise for uh, enabling us to accomplish what I wasn't even sure we were going to be able to accomplish. And anybody, as we tell the story and fill in more details, you'll realize what a miracle this was. But I feel like just explaining how all of these ev those events took place on special times in the life of the Jewish people, uh, to me, was just such a tremendous revelation that this was the Lord's doing. Uh, and even though a lot of people had a part, a lot of people were involved, uh, none of us can take the credit. It, it's all to him. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon us. And as um, the, the Scots shared with me yesterday, if you perform the miracle to help us to get the building, uh, we are just excited about what miracles you will continue to perform afterwards in terms of uh, bringing the message of the Jewishness of Messiah to our Jewish people. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us right now as we uh, desire to understand truths from your word in a greater way, uh, to face the challenges in the days ahead and to draw closer to you in all that we do. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Two weeks ago, Fred Scott shared from the second Torah portion in Vayikra Leviticus. Uh, he gave us some scriptural guidance for dealing with challenges that we might face in the world today. And he suggested that if we were not obedient to the Lord's instructions, we might look back on our actions at some point in the future and think to ourselves, what in the world was I thinking? And speaking of that question, Tonight, we're going to see several scriptural examples where I think the Lord wants us to say to ourselves, what in the world were they thinking? Uh, these examples are provided so we see uh, that there are consequences to our actions, even if we are a part of the community of God. Two weeks ago, the scripture portion ended with a seven-day ritual for the consecration of the Kohanim, the priests and the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in preparation for its use. And this week's portion begins in Leviticus chapter 9 and is called Shemini, uh, which means eighth, referring to the eighth day of this consecration ritual when Aaron offers up various offerings for himself and for the uh, people as the uh, ritual concludes. And then in Leviticus 9 verse 22, Moses comes out of the Ohel Moed, out of the tent of meeting, and he blesses the people. And in Leviticus 9, verse 24, the Kavod Adonai, the glory of the Lord, appears to the people, and the fire from the Lord consumes the Olah, the rising smoke offering, usually called the burnt offering. And then we come to Leviticus 10, where we lose two of Aaron's four sons. Fire comes from the Lord once again, but this time it consumes them because they made an inappropriate offering to the Lord. Nadav and Avihu, as the Hebrew reads, or Nadab and Abahu, uh, as they call them in southern Israel, uh, offered up Esh Zarah, uh, according to Leviticus 10, verse 1. Now, Esh means fire. And Zarah means profane or unauthorized or worldly or strange. So um, the Lord's fire consumes these two sons of Aaron so that the people of Israel might say to themselves, what in the world were they thinking? Their fate was a lesson to the people that even with the Lord dwelling in their midst, he still would not ignore rebellion and disobedience. Now, we, some people might think, well, maybe they didn't know. You know, maybe they were daydreaming or staring out the window the day they covered not offering up Eish Zarah. Maybe you can relate to being in school and looking out the window on a beautiful spring day and not hearing a word that the teacher was saying as you're temporarily lost in the moment. But just because you weren't listening doesn't mean that you won't be responsible for the information that was shared. 
Leviticus 4 verse 2 talks about the need for a chata, a sin offering for a Kohen, a priest who sins inadvertently. And Leviticus 5 verse 3 talks about someone who has come into contact with some type of human uncleanness unawares. Uh, and they need an asham, a guilt or trespass offering as soon as they become aware of it. Because whether we sin intentionally or unintentionally, it's still a violation of God's standard of righteousness. Otherwise, whenever we're caught in sin, we could just plead ignorance of the law. But just as in our legal system today, ignorance of the law is what? No excuse, right? Leviticus 10 verse 10 says it was important to distinguish between hakodesh, the holy, and hachol, the unholy, between tame, uh, unclean, and tahor, clean. In the next verse, Leviticus 10 verse 11, the Kohanim are to teach the children of Israel all the laws, the instructions of the Lord that they have learned from Moses. And in the traditional Haftarah portion for this week, as we read earlier, we find another case where the sin may in fact have been unintentional. The ark has been recovered from the Philistines who had taken it from the Israelites. And David is bringing it to Jerusalem. And how is he transporting it? In a cart, just as the Philistines had done. Now the Lord had provided a way for the ark to be transported. And I can tell you, it did not involve a cart and oxen. The people should have been able to tell when they saw that there were rings on the ark. As Exodus 25 verse 14 instructs them to transport the ark using poles through the rings uh, that are attached to it. Instead, the Torah is being transported in a cart pulled by oxen. And when the oxen stumble... Uh, Uzzah touches the ark in an attempt to keep it from falling. And as we read earlier in 2 Samuel 6, verse 7, the Lord's anger blazes up against Uzzah, and he is struck dead. Now, initially, this seems kind of harsh. But as we look at things further, I, I think we will find truths that may even impact our lives today. By transporting the ark in a cart, the Israelites were not only being disobedient, but they were also being disrespectful. First of all, as we mentioned, the ark was built with rings that had poles that were to be carried by human beings, just like royalty of that day would have been transported. I'm sure we've all seen movies where the king is being transported by his servants uh, using poles in what's referred to as a uh, litter. Additionally, when the Philistines stole the ark, they transported it in a cart. So the Israelites were copying the ways of their enemies instead of copying the ways of the Lord. Finally, the ark is often called the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Aron Brit in the Hebrew. It was a symbol that represented not only having the Lord dwelling in their midst, but also the covenant relationship that existed between the Lord and his people. While the people weren't always zealous for their uh, faithfulness to the covenant, the Lord always is. And he was zealously concerned for the symbol of this relationship being treated with this kind of disrespect. Anybody seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Even though that's a fictional account, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the Lord takes the Ark uh, of the Covenant pretty seriously, and that's what was depicted in, at the end of the movie. So in the Torah and the Haftarah, we see people instantaneously die for not doing things in accordance with God's instructions. But of course, that is the Old Testament, where some would mistakenly tell us we'll find the harshness of the law and judgment. Well, in the New Testament, that's where we'll find love and grace. So surely nobody will be killed instantly in the New Covenant because of their sin, right? Y'all have read. Stand by to see some theological carts being tipped over, and we'll see if anybody reaches out to study them. At the end of Acts chapter 4, the followers of Messiah are described as living in unity and sharing all that they have with one another. 
One of them sells a plot of land and shares all of the proceeds. Apparently, Hanania and Shapira, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, as they say in southern Israel, uh, they wanted to make it seem as though they were doing the same thing, except that they kept some of the proceeds for themselves. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, reveals their deception to Kepha, Peter. And in Acts 5, verse 5, Ananias dies instantly when Peter confronts him. And several hours later, Peter confronts Sapphira, telling her that she is going to die. And in Acts 5, verse 9, she drops dead on the spot as well. So we see that God's principles are even carried through in what we describe as the final renewal of all of the covenants that were made with the Jewish people. As uh, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, tells us in Romans 9, verse 4. <clears throat> and in the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, we find that this final covenant renewal, the new covenant, the Brit Kadeshah in the Hebrew, was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So uh, we continue through the Torah portion and we come to Leviticus chapter 11. And there we find that clean and unclean can be applied in terms of food. According to Leviticus 11 verse 3, for an animal to, to be what we call kosher, it must have a split hoof and it must chew its cud. We also read in Leviticus 11 9 that fish are kosher only if they have fins and scales. Now, I believe these dietary restrictions have been given not to stress us out, not to cause us to become legalistic, but to help us to better understand the concept of God's holiness. Now, why do I say that? Because that's what the scriptures tell us in Leviticus 11, verse 45. We read it earlier. For I am the Lord who brought you out who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, thus you shall be holy ones, for I am holy. He wants his people to be holy like him. Why? So that he can dwell in their midst. And isn't that what we want him to do today, to dwell in our midst? Now, unfortunately, there are many in the body of believers who accuse those who desire to uh, follow these instructions, what we refer to as keeping biblically kosher, um, regarding what foods are suitable for eating of going back under the law. But there are serious theological problems with taking this approach. First of all, it's the opposite of what Paul says in, in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, where he tells us, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Messiah. Secondly, this position is often based on a misunderstanding of the sheep that Peter sees while in a trance in Acts chapter 10. Yeshua's response to an accusation of the Pharisees against his followers in Mark chapter 7 and Paul's letter to the congregation in Rome in chapter 14. So those are just three uh, misunderstandings that are used uh, to justify no longer being concerned or even uh, judging really and, and um, being concerned about those who decide that they will uh, go along with, uh, follow the dietary restrictions described in Leviticus 11 and repeated in Deuteronomy 14. So let's take a look at these for a moment. In Acts chapter 10, since we read that earlier, uh, Peter has a vision of a sheet with all kinds of unclean animals on it. And the Lord tells him to eat. And Peter refuses three times. So I always like to ask, did Peter eat from the unclean sheet? And the answer is no, just as he recounts in Acts chapter 11. Why, why didn't he eat the food that was on that sheet? Well, visions in the scriptures are usually symbolic and are not intended to be interpreted literally. And in this case, Acts 10 verse 28, Peter tells us 
what he has concluded from this vision, and he, his conclusion was not about food. Here's what he said. You yourselves know that it is not permitted for a Jewish man to associate with someone who is not non-Jewish or to visit him. Yet God has shown me that I should call no one unholy or unclean. Peter understood this vision to be about bringing the gospel to Cornelius and other Gentiles, which is what he says in Acts chapter 11, verses 4 through 11. And in Mark chapter 7, Yeshua's followers are accused of violating a tradition of eating without washing in accordance with the Pharisaic tradition beforehand. Yeshua focus on, focuses on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees by explaining that they are defiled not by what goes into them, but by what comes out of them. And he cites a number of examples, uh, including evil intentions, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustfulness, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And he explains that all these things come from within and are what makes a man unholy. Now Mark 7 verse 19 also says, thus he declared all foods clean. And I struggled with this because I was thinking to myself, and, and I've struggled with this in various ways, and I've heard various messianic ways of interpreting it. <coughs> For example, uh, that, uh, that the Greek that is used there isn't found in all translations of the scripture. So maybe it was uh, added in some cases, but I really didn't like that. Uh, answer too much, and, and there are other ones that we can come up with, but I was thinking to myself, Lord, if you gave these instructions for the purpose of holiness, and you still desire for your people to be holy, then there's got to be a way to explain those words that we find in Mark chapter 7 that don't invalidate the keeping of kashrut, the keeping of the instructions uh, in Leviticus chapter 11. And I felt like the Lord uh, kind of showed me that number one, what that is likely referring to is that he was saying that all foods were clean regardless of whether or not you follow the Pharisaic tradition of washing in accordance with their ways. And, and that is a good start, but it's surely not going to convince those out there who use this to say nobody has to keep kosher uh, anymore as a believer, as a follower of Messiah. But then I realized in Acts 15, a council came together to decide what to do about the Gentiles, primarily Cornelius, those with him who had actually experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit as described in uh, Acts chapter 10. Now what do we do with them? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need, uh, circumcision meant essentially becoming Jewish and following all the uh, requirements of the Torah. And of course you know that this council came up with only four requirements uh, for the Gentiles. You can see them in Acts 15 verse 20. Um, here's the interesting thing. Three of those four requirements are about what you can eat. If in Mark chapter 7, everything was declared, you know, BLT, go for it. You know, put your bacon on your uh, filet mignon now. If, if that's what it meant, then why in Acts are they giving restrictions that are based on not eating certain foods? So I really felt like, um, the Lord was, was helping me to understand in a way that I, I think um, I actually know of, of a church who has been uh, fairly faithful to uh, our uh, agreeing with most of the, the approaches that we take uh, in terms of the Jewish foundation of all the scriptures. But when they came to Acts chapter 10, it was an interpreting what Peter did with that sheet. It, it, it was not a, a pretty sight. And so I was like, okay, what argument uh, could I come up with that would be 
so convincing that even those who, you know, have been eating bacon all their life and have had uh, their theological understanding is they can eat anything they want or shrimp with lobster sauce. That used to be my favorite meal growing up. Um, and, and so there, there's all these different foods that we're not allowed to eat for various reasons. But the reason is it's tied to holiness. And holiness means being set apart from this world for the Lord's purposes. And I, I believe based on that understanding, I, I just really... You know, I, I've been a believer since the mid-70s. I've been uh, involved in the Messianic movement since uh, 1984. And yet, I, I think it was today that I really finally had an argument that uh, would um, refute the conclusion that is reached from the Mark chapter 7 passage. So uh, I thought that was really a blessing. Now, you don't have to agree, uh, and you don't have to do things a certain way just because I say to. The reason that uh, we lean on the scriptures and we, we try to help people to see what we believe they're saying is we want you to check it out for yourselves. And we'll see that in Romans 14. Uh, in Romans 14, verse 2, there's someone who doesn't eat certain foods and is described as weak. Uh, this verse is sometimes used as a proof text against keeping kosher. But the ones described as weak aren't ones eating in accordance with the Leviticus 11. They aren't uh, Jewish people keeping kosher. They're described as vegetarians. Uh, then they quote Romans 14, verse 6, saying the one who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, seeming to imply again that the one who doesn't eat is keeping kosher and, and um, uh, that he is the one who is not doing things right. But Romans 14, verse 6 uh, also says the one who abstains abstains to the Lord and gives thanks to God. So once again, this passage is about someone who is a vegetarian, not someone keeping kosher. And Romans 14 verse 5 says that another important part of the food discussion is for each one to be convinced in his own mind. So I encourage you to seek the Lord about this subject. We should not be choosing what to eat based on others' expectations. We should be choosing what to eat based on what the Lord has revealed to us and our desire to be obedient and draw closer to him. Now, another uh, reason that's given is that many believers uh, think that the concepts of clean and unclean are tied to the Mosaic Covenant, which they think has been replaced by the New Covenant. But in reality, the concepts of clean and unclean go back all the way to Genesis. 7 verse 2 where Noah was told to take two of each unclean animal but seven pairs of each clean animal and fortunately for Noah termites and woodpeckers are unclean so he only had to keep up with two of each of them but I would also ask how many of you ate food today just you don't really have to raise your hand I suspect that most of our hands are going up uh, how many of you plan to eat food in the future? Okay, a few of you. Um, <clears throat> the Lord knows that this is an issue that we will deal with on an ongoing basis. And in his wisdom, he's picked something that we all do on a regular basis to help us to better understand his holiness. So there are various ways that the Lord can reveal his holiness to you. And I would just encourage you that, you know, sometimes we, we hear the, the church world uh, explain away the messianic understanding and so I feel like uh, that it's important that, that we help you to understand how we've come to this understanding particularly when it's based on the scriptures and sometimes you know we're not going to be able to explain everything but I feel like something that uh, is fairly significant and, and a place where the Jewish people are really separated from the body of believers we really should be able to be one in Messiah, Jewish followers of Messiah, and those from the nations, uh, the Gentiles. Those who don't have a Jewish background, Paul described us as one in Messiah, but he said we have to overcome our cultural enmity. Well, one place cultural enmity crops up in a hurry is if you go out to eat, uh, or even if you go over their house for a meal of fellowship, and you have to tell them what foods you uh, might choose not to eat. And so we trust that the Lord will uh, bless you with this understanding and um, 
that it will be something that will help you to understand the truths of scriptures in a greater way, to draw closer to, to him, uh, to be um, just more blessed in your relationship to him. Now, <clears throat> I'm hopeful that our actions as believers in Messiah will more and more reflect our understanding of God's holiness. In the body of believers, everybody understands that we're to be holy. The challenge comes from what does this mean? Uh, when it comes to holiness, we have a choice. One option is to seek to apply the truths of scriptures as we understand them in our lives, as we strive to achieve holiness according to God's ways. On the other end of the spectrum, we can do what Nadav, Avihu, Uzzah, Hananya, and Shafira did, make up our own rules and hope for the best. And, and the reality is life is a journey. The purchase of the building for the congregation was really a journey. I would describe it as a roller coaster ride that had a lot of ups where we really thought we were on the verge of being successful. And I will share over time the number of times that we were down at the bottom and it didn't seem like there was any way we could get around the obstacles that we found uh, in our paths. And that's really a description of our, our life as a believer. And it's easy to be faithful when you're at that on top of the mountain, when you're hitting the high point. But the challenge when, when we find out what our faith is really all about, our ability to trust in the Lord, is when we hit the valleys, when we're down at the low point. Can we trust in Him? Can we lean on others in our community uh, to pray for us, to, to support us? You know, just like um, Aaron and her, remember when they held up Moses' arms? so that Joshua could prevail in battle. Sometimes we go through struggles in this world and we need that kind of support. But I believe that uh, we are called to be a community. We are called to support one another. We're called to encourage one another. And as I said in, in uh, Ephesians 2, um, Paul is describing that there may be cultural differences, but we are able to overcome them in Messiah. He goes on to say that there's one Lord, one spirit, one faith, one immersion. And so we have many of these things in common, and they're supposed to bring us together in the body of believers. The adversary would have us uh, see our differences as something that divides us. This is even true in marriages where uh, we, our differences enable us to be more effective uh, as echad, as a team of two working as one. Uh, but frequency, frequently those differences are what we allow to divide us, uh, to see the differences as things to argue about uh, rather than a strength in our lives. Usually couples come together, you know, kind of like magnets, opposites attract. Uh, but then once you go through the ceremony and all of a sudden the opposites become opposition, uh, and in many cases we seek the solutions of this world and the outcome in the body of believers uh, is not pretty when that happens. Is that our TV? Anyway, okay, maybe it's somebody crumpling paper. I'm done. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the things that I've shared tonight have been a uh, blessing to you. As we've seen, that it is by the Lord's grace that each and every one of us is not struck dead immediately for our sin. It is only because Yeshua has taken on the penalty on our behalf. <coughs> So if you've never accepted Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf, if you're here now or even watching on the video, uh, perhaps you've come to realize that the only way that we can approach a holy and righteous God to ask him to forgive our sins, to ask him to forgive us of rebelling against his ways, is through the blood that was shed on our behalf by Messiah Yeshua. So I'd like to ask with every eye closed, with every head bowed, all you have to do to say yes to receiving Yeshua as your sacrifice tonight, the sacrifice offered up on your behalf, is just raise your hand and you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Uh, anybody else? We always give that opportunity. We do not take it for granted. Virtually uh, those of us who have been following the Lord uh, for a long time, we raised our hands at, at one point. Uh, they always say the longest journey begins with the first step. 
So at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to stand up, uh, still in an attitude of prayer. And I, we're just going to say a prayer in support of the one who raised their hand. And even if you didn't raise your hand, you can say this prayer um, for the first time. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I thank you for offering up your son as a sacrifice for my sins. I thank you that I now have a fresh start to serve you from this day forward. I thank you for the free gift of salvation, knowing that I will one day be resurrected, just as Yeshua was, and spend the rest of eternity in your presence. And I thank you for these things. In Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. In Matthew 10, verse 32, the scriptures tell us that if we confess him before man, he will confess us before his Father in heaven. So if you raise your hand tonight to receive Yeshua as Messiah for the very first time, sometimes people are just raising their hands to praise the Lord, and we're happy for that. But if you raise your hand to say, yes, I realize that I need his sacrifice on my behalf. I just like to, uh, I'm going to step out and I'd like you to just come forward to acknowledge before man the decisions you've made. I'll shake your hand and you can go right back to your seat. Anyone who said that prayer for the first time, we want to give you that opportunity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Greatest decision. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Don't miss this opportunity. You never know what will happen when you walk out those doors. Nobody is guaranteed their next breath. Take advantage of what the uh, Spirit of God may have shown you tonight. Uh, as we see Him moving in our midst, that, that he, may, he may well have revealed uh, your need for the Messiah's sacrifice. There's no way we can be seen uh, as good enough in God's sight uh, to merit uh, being with him for the rest of eternity. It's only through the sacrifice of his son. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now I want to talk to those of us who are already followers of the Messiah, but, uh, you know, our sins uh, have been forgiven, but Maybe you've come to realize something tonight about holiness. Uh, perhaps you want to do a better job of living out the holiness to which you've been called. You want to be a more holy vessel, more fit for his service, more conformed to the likeness of Messiah Yeshua, so that you might see the glory of God in your life. Uh, you realize you need to be more separated from the world so that you can be used for his purposes. You may even feel he's showing you to uh, incorporate your understanding of holiness into uh, your choices as to what foods uh, you should eat in the future. We know that he wants us to be set apart for his service to be holy unto him. And this is really uh, about our relationship as followers of Messiah. We still have uh, the defilement of this world. We still have the adversary, the enemy of our souls uh, who would... Uh, doesn't want us to trust in the Lord, doesn't want us to believe that he is capable of producing the miracle. But if you need the miracle tonight, if you desire to be more holy, still with heads bowed and eye, eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? And perhaps the Lord has shown you some other area that he's wanting to work in your life at this time. I just want you to raise your hand so that uh, you will make this commitment in a way that uh, will be meaningful to you later. Uh, <clears throat> Lord, we desire a greater understanding of your holiness so that we might fulfill your calling to us to be holy as you are holy. And Lord, we desire that you would reveal to us any defilement of this world, any strange fire that we may have 
uh, tried to place before you, uh, not realizing that it was uh, not in accordance with your desires. As Lord, we desire to see your glory in our midst in an amazing way. We desire to see you use us, Lord, uh, as a congregation um, to reach out and to draw your Jewish people back to you. And we desire to see you bless each and every person who is here tonight. I pray that uh, some revelation about the truth of your word, uh, Lord, that you have revealed it to them by your spirit, that you have opened eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive this evening. Uh, Lord, as we just desire to serve you in a greater way from this day forward, we ask you to lead us by your spirit, and we ask all these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. God bless you all. At this time, I, uh, you may be seated. At this time, I'm going to call our cantor back up to perform the Kiddush. Sounds a little bit like Kaddish uh, and Kodesh. Uh, it comes from a root that means holiness. Uh, and we will also pronounce uh, another blessing that's traditionally recited at the end of the service, Sabbath service, the Hamotzi, uh, which is a uh, thanking the Lord for his provision. So, um, at this time, we'll have these blessings. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pari hagafin, Amen. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Amen. Lakaya. We say L'chaim, it's a traditional Jewish toast. It means to life because the Lord tells us, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that you may live. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lekin min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. Amen. And with the words of our Lord and Savior, Anoki hu lekin hakayim. I am the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randolph. <clears throat> I want to thank all who had a part in our service tonight. Uh, and I want to remind you that we will be observing Holocaust uh, Memorial Day uh, this coming Tuesday uh, here in the sanctuary at 730. Now we would ask everyone to please stand as we are going to pronounce the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. These are actually the Lord's own words that he wanted Aaron to have the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, Pronounce these words as his words of blessing to be pronounced over his people. Stand and receive this blessing of the Lord this evening. <laughs> Ye saw Adonai Panavaleka by ye sim laka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you his peace. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Amen. As we get ready to sing our closing song, I've had a number of people call me and say, you know, are you still meeting at, at the building? Uh, like I said, it's probably going to take uh, to the end of the year. Uh, it would really be neat if we could do it um, by the fall, uh, but it may even be a little bit after that. So we're going to continue to uh, meet here for some time until we get that renovation going. Now we are going to have our closing song. It's the Ain Kelohenu, which means there is no one like our God. We'll sing it in the Hebrew, just like I did in the synagogue growing up. 
but then we're going to sing it in the English, so just like I didn't do in the synagogue, so you'll know what we've just sung in the Hebrew. The Ain Kelohenu. Ain And now the English. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our Lord. There is no one like our King. There is no one like our Messiah. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Messiah? We give thanks to our God. We give thanks to our Lord. We give thanks to our King. We give thanks to our Messiah. Blessed be our God. Blessed be our Lord. Blessed be our King. Blessed be our Messiah. You are the one, our God. You are the one, our Lord. You are the one, our King. You are the one, our Messiah. Amen and amen. God bless amen. you all. Thank you all for coming. Have a great week. Uh, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to see you this coming Tuesday uh, as we um, remember the heroes and uh, the events so that they might never again be repeated. I uh, hope you have a great time of fellowship. Thank you all for coming. Shabbat Shalom.